Hello, everyone. I'm Derek Thompson, staff writer at The Atlantic. Welcome to Office Hours, our monthly conversation about progress in America and the frontier of science and technology. Uh, today, I am very, very pleased to tell you that I'm here with cardiologist, scientist, and author, Dr. Eric Topol, to answer questions about the next frontier in cancer research and the intersection of technology and healthcare. So thank you all for being with us. I'm gonna ask the doctor maybe five, six questions, and then I'd love to incorporate some of your questions about the scientific frontier in cancer research as well. So let's jump right in. Uh, doctor, welcome. Derek, it's great to be with you. Uh, let's start with the news. This week, President uh, Biden announced a new cancer moonshot policy. Uh, he announced also the creation of a new department, ARPA-H, to improve the US government's ability to speed health and biomedical research. There weren't a whole lot of additional details, but I'm interested when, when you hear of the president announcing a new cancer moonshot, what are you excited about here and what are you looking out for? Well, this is happening in the wake of some really striking uh, advances that truly qualify breakthroughs, a, a term we use all too frequently, but it, it really does apply here. Uh, and President Biden, uh, long before this moonshot announcement, worked very hard on the cancer moonshot uh, before even running for president. So he has been passionate about this. And it's great that he's uh, devoting uh, more priority. Uh, there's going to be a trial that's going to start as an outgrowth of this to use a blood test for the earliest detection of cancer in healthy people. And also ARPA-H, this new innovation a program with a new leader now that's been announced that was part of this uh, yesterday. That's a, an idea to probably align with the cancer moonshot because whereas there's only a billion dollars or so allocated to it, there's already so many things you can do at once. So it looks like a lot of emphasis is going to go uh, for uh, helping the fight against cancer and we sure need it. But the good part there is there's so many things that are uh, in the building blocks now that we didn't have before. Yeah, there's a lot of things happening uh, on this on the frontier of scientific research and, and technological development when it comes to cancer. And we're going to run through a couple of them right now. And then maybe at the end, we'll talk about which of these places you think would have the best bang for buck if you're sitting in you know, the driver's seat of Biden's moonshot policy and thinking about where exactly do we allocate this billion dollars. So some news that broke just this week, there is a genetic mutation called KROS that is among the most commonly associated with various cancers. And for years, researchers struggled to design drugs that could attack this mutation. It earned a reputation, as we were just discussing a couple minutes ago, of being undruggable. Uh, but yesterday, just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal reported that an Amgen-developed lung cancer pill called Lumacross, which tar targets the KROS uh, uh, mutation, beat out a common chemotherapy in a late-stage study and helped patients survive without their tumors getting worse. It did, however, not clearly reduce overall deaths. So putting all of that together, what do you take away from this development? What is most important here? Well, you summarize it well, Derek, but KRAS is one of the most important driver mutations in cancer. Uh, so it, it's a root cause or part of the root cause 
in many patients, uh, diverse types of cancer. And up until recent times, we didn't have a way to get at it. We were using uh, accessory ways, workaround uh, paths. So now we have a direct, this is a pill that would be one of many treatments. This had a preliminary approval, and now we have even stronger data. It didn't do as much as we'd hoped, that is improve survival. It led to tumor shrinkage, which is important, but hopefully we're going to build on that success because it really is a jump forward. In June, you wrote this essay that honestly inspired this entire event. Uh, it was one of the essays that I read this summer about science that really made the most impact on me. And it was about a cluster of, quote, unheard of, end quote, results in cancer research. And you went through a couple different breakthroughs that we're seeing. And I, I want to have you speak to a couple of them. So first, you remarked on a small trial with just 18 patients, 18 patients with rectal cancer. They took the same drug. And in all 18 patients, the cancer vanished in all of them. And when I say vanished, I mean, it was undetectable by physical exam, endoscopy, PET scan, MRI. MRI. Um, and the New York Times quoted Dr. Luis uh, Diaz Jr. of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, who said, quote, I believe this is the first time this has happened in the history of cancer, end quote. Give us some context here. What happened in this study and how important is what happened? Yeah, this is exemplifying why cancer has a different look because you have uh, this particular mutation, it's called MMR, standing for mismatch repair deficiency. It's not uncommon. It's present in up to 15% of people with colorectal cancer, but we don't screen for it. And it's in other types of cancer like breast, prostate, uh, bladder. So to see 11, uh, first in the report, 12, and then another six, 18 consecutive, as you said, these had really advanced. I mean, if you look at the endoscopy picture, you say, oh my gosh, this is so advanced. Uh, but to see complete uh, uh, abolition of the tumor, uh, complete remission with this uh, immunotherapy, so-called PD-1, mm -hmm. is spectacular. Um, and as Dr. D has said, as you quoted, I never seen anything like this. So this is a great harbinger of where we're headed if we get the right therapy for the match up uh, with the right mutation. Uh, we can see advances like this. So this is pretty darn striking. Can you say a little bit more about what immunotherapy is and how it differs from the most standard attempts to cure cancer like chemotherapy? Yeah, well, we, we want to get beyond chemotherapy because it's toxic. Um, it basically is trying to kill cells. And of course, it doesn't discriminate necessarily by cancer cells from our gastrointestinal tract lining and all the other fast replicating cells in our body. So it has lots of toxicity. Now, one of the real issues that has helped to lead to this new uh, look of cancer is what if we could rev up the immune system? And immunotherapy has been starting to hit stride in many ways, not just like taking out your blood and, and re-engineering your T cells and putting it back in so-called CAR T. And then also these like drugs like PD-1 program uh, cell death one and uh, other related uh, checkpoint inhibitors that rev up your immune system to basically recognize these alien cancer cells and squash them. So this is um, starting to take hold now. And, and the, the example that we just reviewed is a stunning one. Uh, but there are of course uh, many other examples, perhaps not quite as striking. And we're starting to learn about how do you match up uh, the best immunotherapy uh, results with the patient's uh, underlying biology. There was another study that also had the quote unheard of attached to it, which was a breast cancer study from, again, this summer, new breast cancer drug um, that the New York Times reported targeted cancer cells with laser-like precision that was so successful, the Times projected it could change the way that we treat breast cancer. So give us the full story here about, the, about this breast cancer drug study. Yeah, so this uh, is a little bit different because it's a monoclonal antibody, not uh, as a immunotherapy, but as directed uh, towards uh, a protein, a receptor. Um, and this had for uh, women with this low uh, human epidermal growth factor, HER2 low, it's called, mm -hmm. which uh, 
previously has been a really tough uh, um, type of tumor to treat with advanced breast cancer. But the results were extraordinary. And yet again, this matching up, you know, that term precision medicine, which has been bannered about for decades now, we're seeing evidence that um, if you match up, it's more accuracy medicine because they keep making the same mistakes. It's precise, but here it's actually remarkable. These results, um, you know, as declared properly, uh, a new standard of care for these patients, uh, unlike, you know, anything we'd seen before. So um, the, the other thing just to emphasize, besides the unheard of survival rate, is the lack of toxicity, the lack of side effects. Hmm. So this is what people with cancer dread is many of them can get uh, successfully treated, but what they have to go through is a living hell. But that's what these sorts of treatments that we're reviewing here today are, sh are also shedding light on being able to liberate from this awful uh, side effects of uh, what was standard therapy. And for ordinary people who are reading these stories or listening to this webinar, or watching this YouTube video, when they read about these breakthroughs, how should they think about the amount of time that is likely going to elapse between these breakthroughs happening in a study and this kind of therapy being de rigueur in the treatment of their cancer? That's a really important question you're asking because you know these treatments are available now. Uh, so the KRAS, as you mentioned, the pill, uh, the immunotherapies have been available. The problem is translating that into practice. And, you know, the oncologists that are hyper aware of these ad advances that uh, are using these in the daily treatment are doing the proper screening of mutations like the MMR or the HER2 low or these various things. So, you know, being able to keep up with this it's a very fast moving field and not uh, all oncologists and physicians are actually uh, up to speed, but these are here and now. These are not, you know, we're not talking about fantasy uh, treatments. Uh, it's just applying them in the right patients. There's one more breakthrough that I wanna talk about before we take some of the questions from, from viewers uh, and listeners. Um, and that's about these different blood tests for screening. Um, tell me a little bit about why the news on blood tests is so interesting to you and so important. Yeah, so what we've been talking about so far in cancer uh, are people who already have advanced cancer and are getting treated. Uh, but what we really want is to, is to detect it at the earliest possible time, at the micro nanoscopic level, right? And so there's four different screening tests um, a couple of them are already out, a couple more that are coming soon for healthy people, uh, for example, age 50 and older. And we could even use better uh, means of differentiating people, perhaps younger than 50 or uh, at any age, um, to uh, use these tests. So these are a tube of blood or a couple of tubes of blood. There's four different companies. Uh, there's Grail, Delphi, Exact Science, uh, and Freenome that are uh, offering or soon will be offering these tests. We've had even more results over this past weekend, reinforcing the ability to pick up cancers at the stage one level. I mean, just uh, remarkable. So that the whole way we screen for cancer in the future, remember Derek, I think you know this, cancer itself doesn't kill people. It's the metastasis, advanced cancer that kills people. So if we can pick up cancer at the earliest possible time before it has a chance to spread, our chance of, 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 of nailing right. uh, is going to be greatly facilitated. So this is exciting. And it could even someday revolutionize not just the way we have hard to pick up cancers like ovarian or pancreatic, uh, but also the common cancers that we can pick up today, but they require annual screening with mammography or every five years with colonoscopy. Who wants to go through that? Mm -hmm. You can have it with a, with a blood test that's even more um, uh, sensitive and specific. So this has a ways to go. We're in the early stages. There's potential, of course, for uh, the use in the wrong people, uh, but it's a big uh, thing that's happening right now. So I mean, moving a little bit into the not purely sci science 
fiction, but somewhat speculative, taking these screening advances seriously, you're saying in a few years, you can imagine a situation where people go to their primary care doctor, they go in for their annual, they get a blood test, and that blood test can screen for what are we talking about? Dozens of potential cancers, most of the most common cancers, all of them, and have a reasonable expectation that you will catch anything at the stage one level? Is this the kind of picture that you're that, painting? That, that's the goal. The okay. goal is that we pick up any cancer. Uh, it, it's, it's, this, it's in the plasma, so-called cell-free tumor DNA, uh, and it can pick it up at levels that are extraordinary um, low. So the only thing we really don't know now, Derek, we talked about immunotherapy a few minutes ago, but what about if you have a positive test and then if you come back a few months later and it's negative and your immune system kicked in and took care of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So we don't know about that because, you know, we could be getting cancer threats at the micro level uh, mm -hmm. and be able to take care of this on our own. That's one of the unknowns. However, the big news is that uh, we've seen now in tens of thousands of people that this has uh, picked up cancers that it's stage one or two very early. Uh, and then once the test was positive, the person underwent, and not only using AI, it also can help tell where's the likely source, like colon or prostate or lung. Mm -hmm. So then they have the, the scans to direct that, to find it, to document it. And many people now from these screening have accurately had cancer detected, diverse, you know, mm -hmm. all different types of cancer. So it's exciting. Um, it's, I think what you just, the picture you just painted is likely where we're going to go over over many years ahead. We're not there yet. We're still in the early stages. I, I just wrote this week, or maybe it was last week, about the latest news on American life expectancy. The U.S. has fallen behind mm. most similarly rich countries when it comes to life expectancy for a variety of reasons. We didn't vaccinate as many of our people in 2021, and so our mortality rates were higher than a lot of Europe uh, from, from COVID specifically. But also there's a lot of other issues specific to America that are causing our life expectancy uh, to be restrained even as some similar, similarly rich countries uh, live longer and longer lives. One area that seems to be an exception to that rule though, is that America seems to have better outcomes from certain kinds of cancers like prostate and breast cancer because we're more aggressive screening. And so it seems it's really interesting to connect that finding from the life expectancy research to this and thinking that a huge aspect of this puzzle is, yes, it's wonderful to have the most sophisticated cures for certain kinds of cancer. But if you can screen at the front end, that's the ball game. So last question on this before I, I pick up a little bit from the audience. What do you think are the most important bottlenecks? keeping us from having that science fiction future that I painted? Is it that the tests need to get more accurate and precise? Do we need to get better at manufacturing these tests so that we can distribute them to hundreds of millions of people a year? Or is there some other bottleneck that is more important that's keeping us from getting to that future where we're all just getting the annual blood test that's telling us whether we have stage one of dozens of cancers? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think one of the problems we have is that each of the four um, of these screening blood tests use different strategies. You know, one uses methylation, one uses sequencing, one uses fragments. And so what if we could put it all together? Mm -hmm. And that would be even more compelling. And so, you know, the idea that it would be so accurate that you wouldn't have false positives and you wouldn't have rabbit hole incidental omas and all that sort of thing. So that's one part of it. The other thing is, you know, Derek, we have this terrible delay of acceptance in medical practice. Uh, the medical community is resistant to change. And there's lots of incumbents that, you know, this is what, how we do things. So that's another part of the bottleneck is in order to affect change in medicine, there has to be receptivity and willingness and we'll have to see. One of the questions from Susan Kim is very related to this issue of American life expectancy. She says, if people exercise regularly, watch their weight and had a Mediterranean diet, how much cancer would this likely prevent? And would oh. it potentially make the cancers that people do get less deadly? 
Well, there's no question that healthy lifestyle that you just was portrayed by the questioner would help. We, it would reduce the, the, the likelihood of developing cancer in the first place. Uh, the problem is we, we're so far away from that. But in those people who do um, have exercise and the right nutrition, uh, weight, all these things, they, their chances for uh, having cancer or having a good result uh, from treatment if needed, are everything, the outlook is, is much better. There's no question about that. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't prescribe lifestyle. I do that every week in my mm -hmm. clinic. Um, but, you know, only some people actually adhere to that or, you know, are willing to really, um, uh, you know, do those things. So, yeah, diet is, is, and exercise are far more important than I think is, are generally acknowledged. So it's, I'm glad that that was pointed out. A quick follow up on that. I, I do wonder what you think about the rise of personalized health devices. Um, I know that you, I, I don't want to suggest that Apple watches are going to be the cure for American obesity. That is clearly making too strong a case. But I wonder if more technology getting closer to the body might not only encourage people to be more active because it, it can notice, for example, oh, you've been sitting for a long time, maybe you should get up and walk, but also that it might be close enough to things like variable heart rate that it can pick up certain maladies that people are developing. Um, what's, what's an area in this space of, of personal medical devices that you're particularly interested in? Well, you know, I think the whole idea of, on the risk centers, whether you're talking about fitness bands like Fitbit or smart watches like Apple and, and many others, is that they are pervasive. We have 80 million Americans, maybe even up over 100 million Americans that have one of these or multiple of these, yes. uh, some of them given by their, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some given by their employer. And the bottom line is, has it really increased activity, physical activity in the population? You know, maybe a little bit, but a lot of these sit in people's drawers uh, collecting dust, okay? Um, it has to be, uh, you know, a willingness to, um, to go after it. Now, we've been talking about technology but, and, and also life expectancy, but I think what we aren't acknowledging, uh, at least so far, is that our life expectancy is not due to any lack of technology. It's lack of, it's lack of equity. Hmm. Uh, we don't have universal health care, and we're a standout from that. And that's one of the biggest explanations about why we have such a dreadful and declining life expectancy and why we're such an outlier. So unfortunately, Derek, no wearable sensors technology is going to address that fundamental flaw in our health system. Yeah, this was one of the key insights from there's a Northwestern economist, Han Schwant, who I've read a lot of his demographic work. And uh, one of his big conclusions is that the difference in health equity for Americans based on their income is so much greater than that for Europeans. In Europe, whether you're poor or rich, those groups tend to live similarly long lives, but the variance in the United States is just dramatic, such that where you are born and how much income your parents earn is so much uh, more predictive of your lifespan, in part because of this enormous inequity in terms of healthcare coverage. Um, Absolutely, and technology can make that worse. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we've got to get to the to the the basis of our problem and. And, uh, you know, I love technology, but I'll be the first to acknowledge that it, it isn't going to help it, the, the, the core issue. Uh, and life expectancy is a, such an important metric of how we're doing. There's a couple of questions about, about screening that, that I want to read and get your reaction to. So one's from Nicole Rubel, who writes, I think you answered this to a certain extent. How do we know which cancers will need to be treated and which cancers will be taken care of via a person's immune system and they won't need treatment? The stage one cancers that we are picking up they might not be necessary to treat. Yeah. We might be able to employ a wait and see approach. That's number one, really related one from David Marsden. Marsden, excuse me, David. With some cancers, overscreening is a real problem. Earlier treatment hasn't historically always led to better outcomes or improved patient quality of life. How can we avoid these kind of issues while embracing the best 
of new screening technology. So two questions that you know complicate this issue of, oh, is, is more early screening this sort of panacea that I may have painted it out to be? Your reaction to that? Yeah, these are really a fundamental question. So the first one I started to address, and that is, we don't even know now when you can pick up cancer so early. Are we picking up just the steady state where, oh, it appeared, and then a week later, you squashed it from your immune system? We, we don't have any studies yet, uh, Derek, to sort that out. We need those uh, because that's, that's a, a true positive in a way, but it's something that's just... Uh, ephemeral and it's just you know it, it's uh, but it may identify people who are at higher risk so that you may want to screen them more often you know every six months rather than every year or whatever now the other question is a biggie which is we've had many types of cancer that we overdiagnosed whereby um, you know the and there, there there's many studies now that have shown oh you picked up all these thyroid cancers but you never changed outcome for example, there's other cancers like that. Uh, and that's actually true. We have to, if we're going to pick up cancers, it has to be um, deriving benefit of preventing progression, preventing the death, uh, all the other things that can happen in, in a person with cancer. So it's true. We don't want to add to uh, the burden of no less the cost and anxiety and everything else of having a diagnosis of cancer and then showing that just because you picked it up early, so what? Hmm. So this is another part of the dimension of early screening that has to be sorted out, that when we use AI to localize it, and let's say we find, oh, well, it's in this organ and we know generally that that, and we do further uh, deep mutation analysis, oh, that's just a benign, indolent thing, just forget about it. Nothing's going to change the, the natural history. So that's another thing that has to get worked out over time. Very important stuff. I'm so interested in this subject of when we learn more about ourselves, but ironically, that new knowledge doesn't teach us as much as we think it would. And there's something sort of existential here because we're learning, especially through the genetics, we're being able to identify all these genes that are associated with various maladies. But sometimes that association is very fuzzy. So for example, you might take a screening, you might take a, take a genetic test, and it might isolate a gene. Say you have a gene that is associated with increased risk for, let's call it heart disease, so it's serious heart disease. And you talk to your genetic counselor and you say, what's the increased risk? Well, we don't know. We just identified it. Well, when is it going to affect me? In my, in my 40s? Is it, is it really early or in, in my 60s, 70s? We don't know. There's only been three studies. We've just identified this. And you're right that, that as we, when you're sort of tiptoeing, you know, dancing on that frontier of knowledge, sometimes you can get information that is without context. And this is a, a really interesting subject to me that, that as we learn more about our bodies and our genes, that we will get, I think, more information without context, where that next question, so what? becomes very existential and hard to say fundamentally because there isn't enough knowledge for a doctor to confidently say, therefore you should do this. We're all sort of learning about it together. You're absolutely right because if you get a, your genome sequence, whole genome sequence today, you will get potentially 60 of the rare so-called pathogenic disease variants that are really important. Then you get a long list of hundreds of what's called VUS, variants of unknown significance. If you want to look at them, Mm -hmm. They're kind of like UFOs, you know, you don't know what it really means, maybe, and you can't nail down timing or anything. So you may not want to know your, your VUSs. So again, just as you're saying, when you are in a new frontier like this, there is the fuzzy zone and people like to, you know, really uh, isolate to the concrete information. But sometimes that, that gray zone is, is interesting to look at, to kind of fold into everything else about a person's you know, uh, a medical um, landscape. And we'll, we're still working that out. Mm -hmm. A question that I really wanted uh, to ask you is about some of the breakthroughs at AlphaFold. Uh, the AlphaFold computer program, uh, I think it was last year, had this breakthrough where they predicted protein structures for the whole human genome. And this is an, an amazing, just remarkable breakthrough in the application of artificial intelligence. And it's not clear to me though yet that we have translated the ability to predict the structure of every protein 
into drugs that we can use to make us healthier. Um, tell me a little bit about, you have a much better understanding of this. You know much more about AI and the intersection of AI and biology than I do. Tell us a little bit about what AlphaFold did, why it's so significant, and how maybe at one point in the near future, it can be used to extend lifespans. Right, well, you know, proteins are kind of the bane of life science and uh, how we can, you know, make drugs, how our body works, how everything is about centered around genes and proteins or genes that make protein. Well, anyway, you know, uh, where we would want to crystallize the protein in 3D to know everything about that protein, all the different binding sites and how we could drug it, like we we're talking about with KRAS. And, you know, so it would take years, years to be able to get the crystal structure of many different proteins. Uh, you know, this is, I, I, I have colleagues that would spend two, three, five years just to get one protein crystallized. Now, you get this alpha fold too, which, um, you know, was a few thousand proteins by the amino acid sequence predicting 3D structure. Now it's 200 million plus. And so it's like a Google search. You put in the amino acid sequence, there you have the 3D structure. I mean, this is remarkable. It's the biggest life science advances, not just DeepMind, but also the University of Washington developed a system on this as well. But this is potentially transformative. The caveat, Derek, that you touched on is, we got to see the drugs that are discovered from it or the, uh, the nuclear core, uh, pore complex, which is in, that gets, uh, it's such an important and complex biologic structure that how things get from the cytoplasm of the cell into the nucleus. That was just cracked by alpha fold. So mm -hmm. we're seeing some advances in biology that is accelerating. That's why I think this is the biggest life science advance uh, since genome editing, which was pretty big. Um, and we're gonna see more. It's just gonna take time. It, it, it's never like a light switch when you have all these 3D structures. Like for example, during the pandemic, we've got 3D structures of the virus and the antibodies and you know vaccines and whatnot. But you know, have we seen it change the pandemic? No. Um, and that's, I think, those are, the, uh, those are the sorts of things that over time will reap the benefits. Uh, one thing that BioNTech, the company working with Pfizer on that coronavirus vaccine, is working on now are personalized cancer therapies. And my understanding of what they're doing is essentially the same way that they synthesized mRNA to respond to the OG coronavirus in order to build an mRNA vaccine to inoculate people from uh, COVID. They might also be able to identify proteins specific to individual tumors to build people bespoke vaccines to help them take care of that tumor? Uh, I guess two part question. Number one, did I mess up that description of what BioNTech's trying to do? And, and number two, where are we right now in terms of progress on mRNA personalized cancer vaccines? Yeah, so this is also an exciting part of the cancer revolution. It's got a kind of a multifold, a multimodal strategy. And the idea here is, you know, before the mRNA and nanoparticle package that was central to the success of COVID vaccines, we didn't have a reliable way of getting stuff in the cell and basically uh, programming the cell. And now we do. So just the chance of being able to have cancer vaccines as a therapy or even prevention in people of high risk like, for example, you could find that, what we talked about, that screening test that picked up cancer at the earliest stage, and you might consider in the future someday an mRNA nanoparticle directed against that type of cancer. Um, but anyway, so cancer, autoimmune diseases, neuro, neurodegenerative diseases, I mean, there's a host of many that mRNA nanoparticles, even you know, cardiovascular now is being approached. So that's one thing. The other thing that's also exciting, uh, just as in cancer, we're trying to rev up our immune system with a vaccine. There's another opposite. It's called uh, tolerogenic, where you use the mRNA, mRNA nanoparticle to, to bring down the immune system. So mm. like, for example, you prevent uh, type one autoimmune diabetes in children, mm. or you prevent rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. I mean, wouldn't this be exciting? So it's got 
diverse potential across many types of diseases. Has the slowness of companies like Moderna, Bio, uh, BioNTech, um, in terms of updating the COVID vaccine, changed your opinion of how successful or how quickly we can move on extending the applications of mRNA science in the way that we've been discussing? Well, I think when we saw how the FDA in late June told the companies, go back and get us a BA5 booster, bivalent right. booster, and they did it in two months, that was a wake-up call because it was the dream was start do something in 100 days and that was done in 60 days mm -hmm. i wish there were more human data that went along with it during those 60 days but that shows you its versatility agility and how you could just turn on a dime um and it's, it's not ideal because we're still chasing variants rather than having a, a universal pan cervical virus but it does show uh, the agility that's striking uh, for this platform that was envisioned uh, when we had the successful mRNA vaccines in late uh, 2020, but now we're seeing it play out. It didn't work for BA1. It took seven months to have a bivalent BA1 vaccine. But when the companies were ordered, just go get us this, they came through and they made 170 million doses of it. I mean, for this country in a, in a, you know, a remarkable uh, velocity. We have a question from Josh Chitlow, who says, it'd be interesting to hear Eric's thoughts on the challenges that ARPA-H faces and their likelihood of success. We all know the myriad successes of DARPA in the physical sciences. Will those approaches translate into the life sciences? And does ARPA-H have the right team, who knows what DARPA's secret sauce was, but will ARPA-H have the right team in place to deliver? Big, awesome, important question. I love the history of DARPA and the incredible role that they played in essentially building the internet and the guts of the modern iPhone and modern computing. Um, obviously, it would be incredible if ARPA-H had the same kind of foundational impact and some extraordinary platform technology that served as totally instrumental in, in uh, reducing cancer rates. Um, but what, what do you see, uh, you know, running a, a, um, an organization as you do, what do you see as some of the um, the secret sauces of teamwork that ARPA-H will want to pick up on. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you need that transdisciplinary expertise, um, you know, uh, things like computer science and, and across all the different biomedical domains. But one of the problems we have is uh, ARPA-H is so constrained with funding, just a, over a billion uh, that doesn't get you so far these days, particularly if you're trying to get more than one innovation into high gear. Then also um, tethered, you know, if it was a standalone entity and just like, just dream, just go shoot for the fences, uh, swing for the fences. And, um, you know, I think that, that these are the constraints that are going to hold it back. I would have rather seen the big budget that was initially proposed, which is small time relatively, with it not having any, um, you know, reporting relationships to uh, NIH or other governmental agencies, give it complete, uh, you know, uh, liberation to proceed. That would have been my preference, but hey, let's see, maybe it'll click. Uh, maybe it'll get legs and we get better funding as time goes on. We, we have maybe time for one more question. Um, and uh, we've got a couple more from, from Susan Kim. Um, Robert Fultz Morrison asks, are insurance companies part of the bottleneck on changes in treatment? Uh, as you were telling the story about just how dramatic, just how transform transformative some of these blood tests could be. We were talking a little bit about various bottlenecks. You know, was it a working prototype? Was it cost? Uh, was it distribution? Here's another one. Is, is it the, it, could it be the insurance companies? Um, to what extent do you see insurance companies often being a bottleneck when it comes to the introduction of novel therapies? Um, yeah, they're a big problem. Big problem. Because unless... The, the test uh, is going to save them money or save the company that they are hired to uh, save money, then they're not going to support it. And so that's what that's why we're still in the early stages. 
is if you're going to do early screening for cancer, you've got to have compelling evidence that it ultimately saves costs. Mm-hmm. And um, that's going to be a roadblock along the way. We'll eventually likely override that. But insurance companies uh, are not really into the science. Uh, they're much more into can we cut costs? Mm-hmm. And we do need to cut costs. I mean, we're over $4 trillion a year. Uh, and there's lots of ways to cut costs that we aren't you know, using. Um, but yes, uh, they're not our friends, uh, the insurance companies, when it comes to innovation. Um, and uh, a lot of these things are upfront costs that are appreciable, which ho- hopefully will pay dividends, uh, pay for themselves, but that has to be proven. Dr. Eric Topol, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate uh, all of your wisdom breaking down these just extraordinary breakthroughs in so many different domains along the cancer frontier. Um, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, this conversation gives you a sneak peek into what's to come at the fifth annual People versus Cancer event, where The Atlantic will soon explore how the latest scientific breakthroughs are reshaping patient care and treatment. Uh, you can register to join virtually at the link that's been dropped in the chat. If you miss this office hours and you're catching us on YouTube, you can catch me again every second Tuesday of the month going forward. You can also read more from me at theatlantic.com and in our new print issue. And if you enjoyed this conversation and want more from The Atlantic, you can support our journalism by becoming a subscriber. Uh, visit our website for more info for more information there. And finally, you can come meet me in person next week at the Atlantic Festival. It will feature conversations with today's most important political, cultural, business, tech, and climate leaders in Washington, D.C. You can sign up for that. Register by clicking the link in the Zoom chat. And thank you all again so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, It was a pleasure to talk to you.